Jim, but uh, Jeff Blyer has been a longtime supporter of VSA and ESA. Um, this is his home that we are actually crashing for our event every year, and he graciously allows us to come here. Uh, the, and, and the the collection of sailplanes that are here, uh, these are all his babies. So uh, tread tread carefully. And uh, Jeff says he has something for everyone. Yep. Uh, and uh, this is what, our 31st, 32nd? I don't know. Do you 39. Yeah. Anyway, uh, welcome to Tehachapi. This is our 30 something year here in Tehachapi doing this. And uh, well, Rogers uh, says uh, Perlin's in the air right now down in South America. There it is, 54,000 feet. And as we speak, we'll probably keep up with this during the day and see how they're doing. And uh, anyway, my talk is uh, just called Sorting Something for Everyone. Yeah. Okay, well, a couple weeks ago, uh, Jan Armstrong gave me a call and asked, uh, could you give a talk at, at, at uh, ESA? And, well, okay, what do you want me to talk about? I don't pick something. Well, I didn't really know what to talk about, but I was up in the uh, coffee shop at the Raven's Nest uh, uh, you know, a week or a couple weeks ago, and noticed this new painting up here. And it's kind of a wonderful painting. It, uh, it was done by, um, hang on, uh, uh, Jan Schofield. His son was learning to fly gliders here, and... Uh, he, he uh, uh, made this beautiful painting of uh, a high-performance uh, plastic lighter uh, flying into our windmills over here, and with Otto Lilienthal kind of silhouetted up in the uh, up in the corner. And I thought, you know, we've kind of got everything in that painting right here on the airport. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about is uh, you know, what we have on the airport here, and how there's something for everyone, and somewhere between the you know ancient history, Jurassic soaring or gliding, and today's modern uh, super slippery sailplanes. There's going to be some things that's going to interest almost everybody here. And that's what my talk's going to be about. Now, you, you might have noticed that cartoon over there in the corner for years and years. I got this at Lajim in England. But it, it's kind of funny. And, you know, a lot of us uh, have done this with our dads. I know my dad has helped out here a lot. Doug Froney his dad uh, was here a lot. Uh, Dan Ryan, I know, did a lot with his dad. And, and Tom Riley, too. So a lot of us did experience and enjoy the story with our dads. And Martin, too, in aviation. And... Uh, so anyway, I thought this is kind of appropriate. And some of us are almost old enough to remember this anymore. But uh, so anyway, I'm going to start out with uh, um, um, Terrence Kucinich. He's going to be one of our speakers tomorrow. We don't know what he's going to speak about, but it's always good. So um, that would be kind of neat. But that's him starting down at Torrey Pines. Then Dan Armstrong also. This is Icarus 2, Dan? Yes. Yeah, this is Dan's Icarus 2. Is that up in Oregon? Where was this? That is at uh, Pacific City... Uh, Cape Kawanda. Okay. The day of the first flight. Actually, okay. just a few minutes before the first flight, 1975. Okay. And uh, anyway, so uh, Dan sent me several pictures of, the, of this glider flying and this on the ground. This is the best one that I like. There's another one kind of showed a sand into it, which I didn't want to show. So anyway, but Dan brought the rudders over, so you can all go over to the, the Armstrong Tanger next door to see the, the, the tip rudders on for this glider at, at, here at Tehachapi. And this is Doug Feronius flying his uh, Waterman glider at, at Torrey Pines. And Doug, you're here. Uh, help me out. We think it's 1911, based on a 1911 design that Waldo Waterman, who was uh, one of Doug's teachers, right? And, and, uh, okay. In 1911, I think it was 1911, Boy Mechanics Magazine, which is popular mechanics today, published plans for a Chinook type paint plant. Mm -hmm. The first published drawings for an rigid wing aircraft in the United States. And while the waterman lived in San Diego, he was 15 years old, and he built one in 1911. Flew it in downtown San Diego, was credited as the first <coughs> fixed wing flight in San Diego. In the early 70s, when hang gliding came back, Waldo was still around and flying, and really interesting, separate talk in itself. But he said, oh, I know how to do that. And he designed an improved version of this 1911 glider, and with another guy, built one, and then Grew up some sketchy plans, and I built this one from the plans. And Waldo came out to the house and supervised it. And it was the year I graduated from high school. Yeah. Um, and if I remember the story right, you're just hanging on with your armpits in that picture. No, actually not. Um, I'm in a seat. You can see I'm kind of seated. Okay. And it's a Bomber Jensen style that he developed for a swinging seat. Oh, okay. 
so, so the glider's in my hangar on the airport. Uh, it would fly if you took it down, although I'm not sure I would do it today. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see the seat. You can see how it works. So. You, you get out of the seat for landing. Then you're, then you're by your armpits. Okay. Well, anyway, so this is kind of what this talks to be about. I'm going to say, well, go see this glider. Well, Doug's got this glider hanging up in his hangar, a uh, place of honor. And so you got to go down and take one. Well, just down this row, about halfway down the row. And uh, he's got some other neat stuff in there, too. So um, every time there's a picture of a glider that's here in the field, I'm going to say, well, go look at it. And hopefully the hangar will be open, or we'll try to get it open so you can go see it. So then continuing on, a huge leap in technology now to the primary glider, which got this, this one right back here. And we've used to fly it quite a bit. We have some Dutch friends that uh, restored one at Hall, and they found all kinds of cracked fittings and uh, in wood. So we kind of parked it until I could restore it. So it just kind of um, sits in the hangar, although two or three years ago we had bad weather here for our vintage meet, or Memorial Day, we put it on a tripod, and we got to do some wind jamming in it. So that was just sitting up out here in front of the hangar. We're all um, got, a, got a chance to wind jam with it. Now, primary gliders, uh, they taught a lot of people to fly before two-place training came in. Uh, you know, in. Mostly in Germany, a lot in England, especially after the war. This particular one was uh, based on a 1926 uh, German SG-38 design. And Slingsby and uh, Elliott's uh, built 115 of, of them in England after the war. Uh, but after the war, the military schools were very popular in, in, in England. and. Uh, you know, the Army cadets had guns and cannons to shoot, the Navy cadets had boats to row and sail. The Air cadets really didn't have any hardware to play with. So the uh, Royal Air Force commissioned Slingsby's and Elliott's to um, build replicas of the SG-38 gliders. So they built about 115 of them, and there's uh, three of them here in the U.S. So one's in the National Soaring Museum, and uh, this one here, there's another one in the Mid-Atlantic somewhere that's just in storage, I guess. So just a couple things on the gliders. This is another uh, T-38, Slingsby T-38, but it's in the um, uh, Deutsches Fluch Museum at uh, Oberschleisheim in Germany near the Munich airport. But it's another Slingsby. And you go downtown in the Deutsches Museum, and there is a real SG-38 downtown in, in the Deutsches Museum. Now, a couple of things, uh, I was lucky, we overnighted in Munich, and my hotel was just like 20 steps up the hill. Jeez. Really neat. And we did this couple of The museum was just down the hill. We drove by it the first time we went to the hotel. And I think the, um, um, the vampire there, the Hanover vampires in there. And sure enough, it is. Uh, right here, you can see the wing. Or this is a replica wing of the wing warming version of it. And then up in the corner, you can see, just there to see the horizontal stabilizer to the vampire. And I, I should have put a picture of that in here. But anyway, that's also at that museum. Fantastic museum yeah, it is. over there. Um, uh, the, the museum at Over Schleisheim is kind of like the Uber Hase facility. It's kind of the overflow from the downtown museum. And uh, you know, this is kind of a picture of a Stammer Lippich uh, Zergling. And uh, the main difference is it had a, a metal uh, tail section back there that was easier to, uh, to repair when they damaged them. And they damaged a lot of them. So, now, one of the things I'm going to talk about a little bit as we go on is how the instrumentation has improved from you know, looking, looking, at, looking over your toes. And that's all you need in the, in the primary. Uh, now, in Europe, they don't trust pilots to just look over their toes and fly the thing. So they made, they made them in Europe put three, uh, put the airspeed al and an altimeter in there. There might even be a variometer in there somewhere. But uh, again, uh, we fly this one uh, with, with no instrument stall. Now, Dan Armstrong, uh, we were flying it here quite a bit. And he, he got me this really Wizzo hang glider airspeed indicator that we can we clamp on the tow, tow hook when we do fly it. When I was flying it, though, um, the ground's coming up so fast, I never had a chance to look at the airspeed. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, I got uh, this. We do put this on the grass harbor when we're flying it. But again, right now, it's kind of grounded until we type and restore it. So anyway, then uh, uh, this is also the, the Danish uh, 2G, two-place primary glider. I could fly that in Denmark. And they made three of them. And uh, I had pronounced the name of it, but, uh, the first two names have no consonants, no vowels. They're all consonants with O's and lines through them and stuff. I have no idea how to pronounce them. The last, the last name is Olsen, and then the 2G. So I got to fly that in Denmark, which is kind of neat. Then after um, the primary gliders, you know, came the secondary glider. Um, and uh, this is one I got to fly in England. This is a replica of the Slingsby, Slingsby Type 1 Falcon, which was a Slingsby-built version of the Lippich uh, Falk. And uh, uh, basically, it's a little oversized uh, proofling fuselage, but it had the lipid stork or storch wing. 
on it. So it was very stable. It had a huge elevator and stabilizer, plus a stable flying wing wing on it. It was very, very stable, fun to fly. And which was really neat. Yeah, I'd never landed or taken off on a skid in the grass before. That's a wonderful experience. So, but anyway, from the, um, the, the, the secondary gliders, and we call them utility gliders here in the U.S., uh, they went to the, um, the utility, uh, in the utility gliders, this is a Slingsby Cadet, the found but all you need, you know, airspeed altimeter, and the variometer, you could get some rudimentary soaring in the secondary gliders. And then, it's kind of an interesting story, but uh, uh, down below is our all Blackson's uh, T-31, which is here on the field in a trailer, and I don't know if we get to see it this weekend or not. And the, um, the cadet became the tutor. They put longer wings on it. Now all, and, and they, so they replaced all the wings with the tutor wings, and so the cadet wings all got put on the, uh, the T-38 grasshoppers. So those are recycled wings from a, a, a Kirby cadet on that. And then it then evolved into the two-place tandem tutor, and a little bit later on, that's what the or the tandem tutor. Then back, back to Tehachapi now, this is Len Erickson's uh, ULF-1. It's down in the hangar, you'll be able to go see this, and the hangar will be open. You can see her somewhere. He's up, anyway, he's up here this weekend. And uh, he's got quite a few things I'll send you down to go see. Neat stuff down in his hangar. He built this from plans, modified a little bit, the steel tube fuselage. And also in Len's hangar, uh, he's got the, his Schweitzer 119 utility glider. Now, remember how Schweitzer does their designations? Uh, it's, these are, these, this is an SGU-119 anchor <coughs> ceiling and an SGU-222, meaning utility gliders. And of course the 126 or all the other Schweitzer, or most of the others were SGS, Schweitzer gliders, sail flights rather than utility. So anyway, both of these are down at Lynn Erickson's hangar. And one thing I want to bring up is both of these were offered in a kit. Remember, we used to be the Sailplane Home Builders Association. Because we've got to remember kind of where we came from. So these were kit gliders. And interestingly, uh, I had the, on top here, I had this one, Dan Armstrong had it for a while. Um, it was another SGU or 222EK. They were both kit built gliders. And uh, interestingly, the N number and the serial numbers were, were sequential. I can't remember which was, which was first. So, but anyway, yeah, Buttercup is still down here, um, in, down in Len Erickson's hangar. You can see a beautiful glider. And then the next glider up was the um, intermediate sailplane. And that was a Brunel baby. And uh, uh, a couple, couple things about the Brunel baby. Uh, well, first of all, Lynn Erickson built one. It's down in his hangar. We can see it. And beautiful job building it. And then the American version was the Bulls Baby Albatross. And again, the, the Baby Albatross was a kit-built sailplane. And all over the world, Bruno babies were built from plans. So again, home builder airplanes. And uh, here in the U.S., we all kind of loved instruments. And, uh, you know, instead of just the three basic instruments, in the U.S., we had to do more, you know. So they had a turn and bank indicator in this one. On the um, left of the picture is a, a non-sensitive altimeter. Then there's a bubble face compass. There's a pellet variometer. There's a turn and bank indicator with a skid ball in it. And that little thing that looks like a skid ball above that, I think that's an inclinometer for your bank angle. I think that's what that is. Because there's numbers inscribed on it. And then, of course, uh, an airspeed indicator on the right. The levers at the left are you know, spoilers on the top, or tow race on the top, spoilers on the bottom. That lever down below is a, a brake. A wheel brake. Now, these are lockable um, handles for the spoilers, so you had to lock it to go down and pull the brake. If you just released it, the spoiler would go down and back in here, and the brake wouldn't do anything. So, <laughs> so we've incorporated that into one handle now on, the, on our new lighters. But uh, um, anyway, so that's that. This is actually an instrument panel on mine. And you, know, you notice that uh, they've got a pellet variometer up here on that. And there were several different, different ones that were available. There was, uh, um, of course, the Robinson variometer, there was uh, the, the Pfeiffer variometer. Any relation, Neil? Where's Not Neil? that I know of. Okay. There was a Pfeiffer variometer, and there was also a, 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 a Gill, um, what is it? I wrote it down somewhere. There's another one, a Gill Walters uh, variometer, and that might be what that is. And that's what Dick Johnson had in his, his Bullis Baby Albatross. And there's mine, and th that might be a Gill Walters in there, because it came from the West Coast um, in mine. And you can take a look at it in there. And then here's Holly Bolas demonstrating a Robinson variometer. And uh, anyway, here's a, a replica Robinson variometer. It's made by Klaus Hein in Germany. Klaus is an incredible craftsman. And he made this uh, replica of a Robinson variometer. <coughs> we'll play with it a little bit later after, after I talk. And so anyway, but I just thought that was kind of funny. Here's Holly Bolas uh, demonstrating that at the Bolas factory down in San Fernando. 
And uh, the Volzes were offered in, in Home Builders Kits. You can see a full size uh, a copy of, of the, the sales brochure to it. But it, it came in uh, 10 kits, and you could buy them one at a time, and package the kits, the whole thing, or you can even buy the glider you know, completely assembled ready to fly. There was only one sold that way that I know of. And I've got that one hanging up over my hanger at San Luis Obispo. So again, you know, a lot of home builders. The 126, another great kit. This is one that a group of us uh, took over to Europe and kept it there for about four years. And that, this is actually in Pavulo, um, Italy. It's over the Castle of Montecupulo, near Pavulo in Italy in the Apennine Mountains. And we flew it all over Europe. Uh, we would uh, take one of the people, who, wherever the meet was going to be, the meet was going to be, the next year we'd get one of the people, one of the people that lived in that country that were sponsoring it. And if they would take it and house the glider for the winter, they could be a full partner on it at the next vintage meet in Europe. And that worked out really well. We, we had some, a lot of fun with that. But you know, the 126s were also kit sailplanes that you could buy. And, uh, and Tom, was yours an EK or a K? I don't believe so. It would have a K at the end of the... No. So, yours is a B? Yeah. Yeah. Most of the kits were C's, so they were 126 CKs. My mind is imagine an A designation in any kit built by the Associated Glider Club. Yeah, I think the A's, B's, and C's were all offered as kits. The D's and E's were not. <laughs> and but, but usually you see a K after the designation on, on the data plate. But yeah, maybe they didn't do that till later or something like that. And then uh, of course the brig libs. Uh, when I started flying lighters in '67, '68, uh, uh, these were all the kits that were available. The 126, the one was available. The brig lib BG12 was available. One interesting thing about the brig lib down at the bottom here. Yeah, you can buy it just like you could the bolas. You can buy one kit at a time, group of kits, the whole thing. And you can, I don't think they offered them fully uh, built, but uh, anyway, the Brigham's did did have all that. I, I know Walt probably remembers if Ron Martin's here. Um, we were all there at the same time, but they had shelves full of parts for these kits, and it's just fascinating to go in the hangar. Wow, I'd love years? to build one of those kits, you know. Jeff, what years was that? Well, I was there at the end of 67 through 69 mm -hmm. is when I was flying out there. And they also still had kits for the uh, BG-6. <laughs> there it is. got Ross and finally built one in his son Ken. And that's the one that Ross had up here that my nephew Joshua now has down in his hangar chapter. So it was built from those, it was an unbuilt kit that was finished by, well, by the rig libs. So that's pretty, pretty, pretty slick. And then of course, remember the HP-14. Uh, I wrote it, all the, I wrote all the companies and got, uh, got the brochures and see the kit was for the V-tail was a, uh, $3,300 or $3,400, and the, uh, the tea tail was, was $100 more. And this, they sent you this Wizzle postcard, a picture of it, and it, a nice letter. And uh, anyway, this is what, what I got sent when I wrote back there to Ryan Field. Now, just here on the airport, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, go out here and look, there's an HP-14 that was built and it's polished. Here it is a picture of it, sit, just sitting right out here. Look at the workmanship on it, it is gorgeous. So uh, there's not a, a smile or a divot anywhere in it. And uh, uh, it takes a lot of guts to build an airplane, a aluminum airplane, and polish it, because uh, you, you, you can't make mistakes. Paul Schweitzer said they built one 123 for Bill Ivins that was polished. He said it almost cost double to build it than it did the other, <coughs> because they had to spend so much more time and be so much more careful in building it. So he said, we never built a, a polished one since. So, so there are a couple others got college, but not at the factory. And somebody said there might be another HP-14 here today. I, I don't know, Dan, or does anybody remember? <coughs> uh, somebody told me there might be another HP-14 here, so we might have two of them on the field today. Now, this is Ron Martin's uh, Schweitzer 2-8, which became the TG-2. And it's over in Ron's hangar. You'll be able to see that. It's just gorgeous. And uh, it's got the polished leading edges. I had to paint mine. And, because um, they, they were in such poor shape, and then uh, Doug Fronius, uh, it, 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 it had to be covered his. Mine were worse, I had to cover Yeah, so, uh, so his are family covered, but Ron actually did it the way they're supposed to be, uh, natural aluminum and polished, and it's gorgeous. And there's actually three 2-8s that were sold as kits. So Schweitzer's doing kits clear back then. And, uh, and of course we have the TG2, now Paul Schweitzer, it's like our second or third home builder meet here at Tansby. He was our, our Sunday speaker. So he came out and he uh, uh, knew that I was uh, uh, I'd been corresponding with the factory a little bit, getting drawings and stuff for my restoration. And so he wrote me a letter, the first of many. Those of you that got on Paul's mailing list, you, know, you got lots of letters. But the uh, first one he sent said, well, if I'm going to be at Tansby, uh, could you bring your TG2 over and so I can see the progress on your, on your restoration? 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. So um, I treasured it up and um, brought it over. So that's Paul, and he showed me. Uh, um, he told me a lot of neat stories about it. He said that he and his brothers uh, um, built those wings. They're all PK screws. There's very, very few rivets in the wings. And they're all PK screws. And he just said, see the size of my wrist? We put every one of those screws in those wings. <laughs> 57 wires. <laughs> so, um, and then also, um, on one of the wing spars, is on the left wing spar, in towards the root, uh, in pencil, it was on the zinc chromate, but in pencil, he wrote, you know, inspected PAS and then the date. You know, Paul E. Schweitzer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, they were just out of school, you know, and they didn't know that, you know, you put a pencil mark on aluminum and it says crack here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, so I, but I just uh, varnished it over. So when I painted it, uh, I, I masked it off and I just put the, some epoxy, uh, the stitch epoxy clear varnish over so you can still read that. <clears throat> so summer store in the future will be, oh wow, look at so then, of course, there's a picture I show every year uh, of, of mine sitting out in the flowers. And then, uh, this is back to Elmira in 1995, um, or this is in, in, in 2000. In 1995, uh, we had our first international vintage sailplane meet in Elmira. And, you know, a few months before, a fellow from, uh, he lived in New York at that time, uh, he uh, wrote me a letter saying that he was going to build a model of TT2, and he wondered if he could come to Elmira and photograph my model for the documentation. So his name is Peter DiStefano. And so he, he did, and I didn't hear anything from him until 2000 when we had the second uh, the International Vintage Sailplane Meet in Elmira. He says, well, the model's finished. Could I bring it to Elmira? Well, sure. So anyway, so he brought it, and he actually flew it in the evening there. And uh, here's a picture of me holding it. Well, last September, I got the, he, he contacted me um, through the VSA, saying that, well, I'm 93 years old now, and I'm looking for a home for the model. And so it just so happened in November, um, my family was going back to, to a wedding back in North Carolina. And so I spent a day at his house, and anyway, there it is. It's hanging up in the back of the hangar right now. So it's just an exquisite model made by Peter Stephens, a real master aero modeler. And he has a, um, he had a whole garage full of models. Now here we have Chip Burr. Is Chip here? In the hangar? When he went next door, he's got a whole bunch of just exquisite model airplanes. We're, we're displaying those this year. And next year, we're going to kind of have a Schweitzer theme. And uh, he's got a model, I think, he's building the last one of, of all the Schweitzers. And so they'll be on display like in the museum uh, next door next, next year at this meet. And then this is the panel on my TG2. And it's pretty much uh, right off the, T the Schweitzer drawing. I ended up getting a lot of the drawings of the TG2 from the Schweitzers. And this pretty much shows what it's supposed to look like. And uh, now when I got it, it had... Uh, uh, just a square cutout here. And I didn't know what it was for until I think Doug Fronius brought a uh, Robinson uh, pellet variometer. And, oh, that fits. <laughs> so, so that must be what was there. Well, if you keep going, if you look at it now, there's a Robinson pellet variometer, but it's, it's one that I made. It's not very good. Klaus Heinz is infinitely better than mine. <laughs> but uh, the one I built is the one that I use in, in my TG2. But when I was uh, just got a new co-pilot at Pacific South Air West Airlines, I was fine with the captain. We got talking, of course. You know, we always talk about gliders when I was in the airplane. And he said, well, you want to learn to fly in gliders? Oh, really? Where? And he said, well, I learned to fly in a TG-2 at Lake Elsinore and Torrey Pines. I said, well, my TG-2 was based at Lake Elsinore and Torrey Pines. And back in those days, we, we flew with a, a captain. You flew with the same captain all month. And so anyway, I told him the end number of it, and he came back with his logbook, showed me his logbook, and said, I'm going to find your glider. It was dangerous in that cockpit, wasn't it? <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> oh, you got a couple glider files together. <laughs> Dennis knows that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he, he, came, he says, do you recognize this? I said, oh, I bet that went in this hole right here. <laughs> he said, well, I was the mechanic at the, at the club, the glider club, he said, it wasn't working, so I took it home and put it in my toolbox. And you want it back? There <laughs> <laughs> it is. And uh, uh, so anyway, this last couple of weeks, I've had three or four people ask how these things work. So if anybody's interested, it is all clear, and you can see exactly how it works. So after I talk, if anybody's interested, we can play with it a little bit. And uh, so anyway, but now this is the way the drawing kind of shows the instrument panel is for the, for the military. In reality, look at all the empty holes. <laughs> now, I'm not sure, but I think that might be either Dick or Dave Johnson at 29 Palms in theirs. Theirs was conscripted. 
by, by the Army. So I'm not positive. This picture was in a group of the school at 29 Palms. But if you look at his socks, those aren't very uniform socks. It's the loafers. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look very military to me. So uh, I don't know, but the, the, it, the caption of the book was, uh, uh, there it is. But you see, it not only has an airspeed altimeter, it has what, what's either um, a Gil Walters variometer over in the corner there, or that might have been a Robinson. The Robinsons I've seen all seem to be black. And have you ever seen a white one, Doug? I haven't seen a white one. I, I've got one, and it's, it's kind of cast plastic color. There's no color. Okay. Yeah, and then um, I know I had one that to return to nature, and I know um, uh, Jim, Kurt, you guys had one, didn't you? That was just a pellet barometer. What's that? You had a Robinson very owner that was just disintegrating? Yeah. Yeah, I had one too. Most of the original Robinsons <coughs> didn't last. <laughs> Whatever plastic they used just, did, just didn't stand up to time. So anyway, that's just more of the instrument talk. And with the TG2 and the bolus, you know, for the 50th anniversary of Orbital Wright's 9 minute 45 second flight, I got invited to take uh, the bolus and the TG2 back to Kitty Hawk. So my kind of point here is that, you know, having old gliders opens a lot of opportunities to do really fun things. And I actually got to land the TG2 on the hollow grounds right by the wow. monument where, um, where all of the, the, there was 12 of us that got to land there. And it, it, it was pretty, pretty neat. Then, of course, the T21, which is sitting over there, we haven't flown that for a while either. Uh, the wings are finished and covered. I just have to varnish the open bays, weigh it, and it'll be ready to fly. So here it is over at San Luis Obispo. There's Rob Morgan. I think he's in here somewhere. Um, that's him standing over there, kind of waiting it down. I think Harry Irvine was there that day. The occasion was we put the wings on and rigged the spoilers and ailerons before we covered the wings. The wings are now fabric covered. It's just that it's, they're all going to be open. See how the rudder is open with just varnish on it? That's how the wings are going to be. So, anyway, here's the instrument panel of the T21. And again, basic instrument panels airspeed altimeter, we've got a pellet variometer. One addition that we have here is a cook compass. It is, it's, it's British, and uh, you know, most compasses are absolutely useless in gliders. You're just going round and round, and um, we have to roll out, pretty much roll out on a, a, a landmark to uh, roll out on our course. <coughs> well, back in the, in the days, uh, you know, in the late 40s and 50s, they, or all through the 30s, really, they had gyros, they'd serve up in clouds. And you know, they got done with the thermal, they would level the wings, and they didn't know which way they were going to pop out, because the compass, by the time they got level, the compass, oh shoot, I wanted to go that way. So they have to either go back through the cloud or um, um, you go around the cloud to go on course. It, it took a lot of time in a contest. Well, Philip Wills from England, who won the 1950 World's Championships, he actually credited the compass quite a bit with, with his win of the, of the world. So I happened to be able to get one. And actually, uh, two. Here's one right here we can play with a little bit. And, and there's one in the Slingsby. But uh, um, anyway, so he actually credited that compass quite a bit because uh, well, it's on a gimbal, and so it stayed this way. And if you look at it, it's kind of backwards. It's kind of interesting to look at after I finish my talk here. And then, so more, you know, improvements in navigation uh, was, was well, the Cook Compass was one of them. And you've probably all heard me talk about the uh, Tate Compass. It was, a, it was an inexpensive aircraft compass that made in England. And uh, um, Mr. Tate even made a whole bunch of them, sold them all over the country. But they were horribly unreliable. They, people would, uh, um, you know, if you're on things like tiger moss and you know gypsy moss and gliders, were just flying willy nilly all over England. You know, they had no idea where they were, and they were so bad. To this day, we have the phrase, "He who has a tapes is lost." Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, but uh, that, you know, that was just one thing that uh, um, that helped with uh, um, you know, the instrumentation and advance in instrumentation. Now, most of my glider flying still is in the standard Austria. It's kind of back behind the Slingsby. But I got all my diamonds, I got my landing pan in it, and uh, it, it was just a great sailplane. I just, uh, uh, this is this mine in the front, and the, 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 there was two SHKs back behind us. This is at one of the wave camps down at Cal City a long time ago. And uh, um, my first try, I got my diamond altitude in it, and uh, uh, it, just, it was quite fun. Uh, the glider behind mine was Paul Bickles, a, a guy named Lee Maxson, he's an American pilot now, and he's about four or five years younger than me. But uh, he still owns that glider, and that, but Paul Bickles, the one that originally bought it and owned it, it had all the Bickle mods on it, if you remember, if you would modify gliders. 
put all kinds of fancy modifications. So that's the SHK with all the Bickle mods. And the one behind that was the 1967 SHK, which had a bigger, larger cockpit for us Americans. And uh, um, a guy named Dave Woods owned that. I don't know what happened to that glider now. But all three of us got our diamond altitudes there at Cal City that year. And then uh, this is a, a picture that Mark Grubb took of, of uh, me climbing out. It was actually in an east way here at Tehachapi. It's a neat picture because it looks like I'm really, really high. But just the way the picture came out, uh, it, we were only about 12,000 feet. It was good climbing in an east way, which is not real common here. And uh, it was a great picture. And, uh, Mark and Rich Benbrook were in a Switzer 233, and Mark uh, got that picture from a 233. You could claim 65,000 feet in there. I know. Well, it looks like I'm really, really high. Yeah, that's why I like the picture. But in reality, yes. <laughs> but what you can see, though, if you look under the wings, see how all the paint's missing there? Well, when I got my diamond, or I got my 26,000 feet in it, uh, at the wave camp, um, it had been restored. Uh, Chimp here used a kind of real hard tan-colored uh, filler. It had, the back of the wing's kind of got a little bit of a, a cusp in it underneath there, and to smooth that out, they put uh, filler in it. And when Ross Briglett refinished it for me, um, he put another kind of filler in there, and it had a Dupont acrylic enamel, I think it was Dupont Centauri paint that went over the top of all that. Well, now you've got wood, you've got two layers of different uh, uh, fillers and paint, all different thermal expansion coefficients. So anyway, we talked about this uh, before we launched all the three of us in a wooden sailplane. We said, okay, well, let's just let's go on up, and however long it takes you to get up to your altitude, spend about the same amount of time coming back down, and so maybe you wouldn't thermal shock it and crack your paint. So I spent you know, almost three hours going up and almost three hours coming back down, came back down and landed, and looked, hey, great, no problem, and, you know, it worked. So mom and dad were living down in Roseland at that time, so I took another tow in the afternoon and hopped over and landed at Roseland in their backyard and tied it down. And uh, uh, in the morning we got up and there's big chunks of paint sitting under the glass. Oh. <laughs> so I just took all my effort to kind of finish, finish it off. And then, oh, and I thought there was structural failure in the wings. It turned out there wasn't, but uh, uh, me and my nephew Josh uh, <coughs> were out in the desert there too. And then summer vacation, nobody else was at home. He was all alone in his house. So anyway, we took the wings over, let him sand them, and, um, Paid him, and um, anyway, that's how he, he that's how he got the money to solo at Dad Roseman uh, years ago. So anyway, then uh, well, here's my first uh, cross country attempt. Uh, it's about six miles up here, <laughs> Monolith Canyon. But I always tell everybody that you know, as far as glider is concerned, I'm outstanding in my field. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, never go with the Austria. But, you know, most of my flying was done in the Austria, and every when are you going to move to the next solo technology? Well, everybody kept bugging me. When are you going to go to the next level of technology? So that's about when I got the grasshopper. No. That's not what we meant. So I ended up uh, getting, the, um, getting the Genesis. And uh, I had met Jim Marsky. I was, the, I was the president and also the Western Vice President of Home Builders. And uh, that was the year the, the starting convention was in Indianapolis. And Jim Marsky was one of the featured speakers there. And he uh, um, uh, and I, he called, or we got together, and we said, okay, we'll man the booth for the, for the home builders. So now I get there, and I'd never met Jim Marsky before. I knew about it, and I'd read about it. You know, he'd been designing fine wings since the late 50s. And uh, so I, I, I thought, he's going to be an old guy, you know. So I'm over looking, and looking, and where is he? Where is he? Because we're in the room, and he's going to give his talk. And, Anyway, this young guy steps up, and it turned out Jim's kind of like Dick Clark, he just never aged. <laughs> and anyway, but uh, got to meet him, nice guy, and yet, while we were in the booth, he had the preliminary you know, sketches and performance calculations for, for his new letter, the Genesis. And uh, we got talking about it, and of course, I've always been really interested in flying wings, and so this sounded really intriguing to me. So I mentioned at the time, I just said, you know, if you can get in... Somewhere about that time, Rob Morgan let me fly his uh, um, LS4, and I'd been flying the Austria. And so that was kind of the first, you know, high performance, you know, really nice sailplane that, I, that I'd ever had to fly. And I just, you know, if you could get the handling characteristics, that you've always heard stories about flying wings, stories I'd never flown one, but you always heard nasty stories about flying wing handling. If you can get the handling characteristics, kind of like the LS4, so I'll buy one. Well, anyway, um, uh, I didn't put a down payment down on right away, but a friend of mine, Jim Stoya, did. And I got hearing more and more about the Genesis and Jim, uh, and I was kind of sad, sad that I didn't put a down payment down. Well, anyway, uh, Jim Stoya called and said, well, he didn't want his option more. I mean, would I like to buy out his option? So I did. And finally one day, uh, um, yeah, the guy got a phone call saying, well, your glider's in the bowls. They'll put up or shut up. And uh, so the, the one they had down at Estrella, Arizona, it's serial number four. Mine's number 12. 
um, was already in his own. So I called him up and asked if I could fly their glider. That I had one in the holes. He said, "Come on down." So I flew it, and it's a delight to fly. You, you cannot. It's hard to tell that it's a flying wing. It has absolutely normal, normal flying characteristics. Uh, there's one little flying wing characteristic that, if somebody hadn't told me about it, I'd probably eventually have figured it out. But it would have taken a while. When you hit a thermal, a flying wing wants to maintain its angle of attack, and uh, so it pitches you down. But what you do with a thermal, oh, it's a thermal. You pull back, so you really get a neat feel on the pullback, like you're really climbing in a thermal. So it kind of exaggerates when you enter a thermal, and so I kind of think that's a real positive. The other thing is, you know, the Genesis did sprout that little horizontal stabilizer. They call it a trimmer. They didn't call it an elevator a horizontal stabilizer. But when you're looking around for traffic, you can see the tip of that in the corner of your eye. It scares the hell out of you. <laughs> you think there's traffic right there. Oh. So, so anyway, now this is my friend Hans Dismal flying it. He was a KLM pilot. And we had a, an agreement where when he had Los Angeles overnights, he could come up and fly my gliders. And when I had Amsterdam overnights, I could go out and fly his gliders. So that, that kind of worked out pretty well for a lot of years. But anyway, so that's Hans flying it there. Uh, Josh, uh, my nephew Josh, or Todd Schultz, they were flying my TG2, and one of them got that picture of Hans. The same with this picture, the same same flight. So those are the only two really neat pictures I have, I have of my bolus, I mean of my Genesis in flight. Um, now, um, that's, that's the instrument panels of Genesis. Now, of course, now we're getting all kinds of fancy electronic stuff. And in 1999, uh, in 2000, this was kind of near the state of the art. The Cambridge was kind of on its way out. I mean, you could still buy them, but other neat stuff was coming in at that time. So I was kind of a little bit behind the curve when I put the Cambridge in there. It's still in there, and I still like it. It still works just fine. And so that was kind of state of the art uh, then. And now, um, let's see, the next one is getting ahead of myself here. But uh, I think the next one, yeah, okay, so this is uh, the um, ASH-31MI. Now we've got, uh, Dan Ryans is here on the airport. We'll probably get to see it sometime today or this weekend. Dan, where are you? I saw you somewhere. There he is. And so, it, anyway, I'm inviting people to look at your glider. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, anyway, uh, but this is the latest AVR to self-launching. Um, you can fight a, what, 22 meter? 21 and 18 meter <laughs> and uh, span, so it, it's kind of an all-around glider, and it's just fantastic. I mean, wow! Why do you see this thing? And then it's also got, you know, my, the Cambridge stuff. That's all old. That's all 20 years old now. But in these, uh, you can see it's uh, it's all electronic, all kinds of screens. And this isn't Dan's. This is just one I got off the internet. But you know, it's just kind of fuzzy. Just look at all that ozone in there. <laughs> it's just <laughs> all kinds of stuff. So kind of the gist of my talk is, um, we've got everything you want, from all the bells and whistles, clear back to bare, bare basics. And somewhere in all that, we ought to all have an interest somewhere. For me, you know, I said, so from the Bruno baby to the discus, you know, somewhere in there is kind of where our interests are. For me, it's mostly the vintage, um, vintage gliders. And uh, for the future, now some of you young guys, this is up to you, where, where are we gonna go from here? What is going to be the next generation of gliders? We've talked about a 100 to 1 glider. Is it going to happen? I don't know. But if it's going to join it, you have to have some real clever um, ideas to, to get there. And this is actually uh, uh, John McMaster's uh, rendition of the, the, the Altosaurus? Mm -hmm. Altostratus. Altostratus. And, uh, and the, the painting was done by Jack Olson. This was done back in, 70, back in the 70s when this painting was done. But it's still a good representation of where we're going. You know, what's it going to take to get 100 to 1? You know, we're going to have to have, you know, blown wings or you know, suction on the wings. How are we going to get that? Solar power? You know, I mean, how are we going to get that without getting too far away from the basic glider? And, and I just don't know. Uh, now, just the other day I was watching a YouTube, and this is a, a, an autonomous glider that can autonom autonomously thermal. And this guy had a, a little program to where he did a very logical search pattern it's a, it's a motor glider, it's an ASH, or AS, it's Schleicher something, 28, 28, what was that, the H or a, I don't remember what that one was. W. It, it, 28, and the model, but it's got an electric motor on it. He would launch this thing over the field, and it would go in this pre-programmed search pattern for a thermal. And you can see it, and he had it all plotted, he had a camera in it, and you can even see it has a pedal tube on it, it has variometers, it has all the whole telemetry goes back to a, a laptop like this that he had on a, a tailor just sitting at it in, in his field. This thing would go search, it'd find a thermal, it would start circling in the thermal. <coughs> and it would start following the it would start following the thermal. And pretty soon uh, he said, well, I can't see it anymore, but he's still looking at his camera and he said, it's getting kind of far away, I'm gonna have to come back. 
be, be fired the motor and bring it back to the field. But anyway, this autonomous soaring is getting closer, and they have it in models now. So you know, how are we going to how are we going to do that? And then uh, oh, just a little dig here. Uh, uh, you know, all of us have kind of gotten soft. You know, we used to know how to um, we used to have to take the pump, the soundings, and you know, I, I for here I get soundings from Vandenberg, Edwards, China Lake, Bishop, and Reno, and I have to plot my own soundings to see what it looked like. Now you just you pull it up with this is Dr. Jack, and then you also have cross country skies and also sky sight now that do all that. It's you know a lot more detail than we used to do it, so we don't really have to understand how to forecast soaring weather anymore. And then, uh, oh, that's not it yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. Um, what else is there? Oh, navigation. You don't need any maps. It's all on GPS. You know, you don't have to know how to navigate more. Speed to fly. And you just you know, follow your command bar. You know, you used to have a treaty ring, and then that guy, when you got a so far gamer, you, you didn't even need a treaty ring anymore. You just kind of set this, and your airspeed and altimeter and very owner told you how fast to fly. But now we just have a command bar on our, on our flight directors. And uh, then uh, uh, traffic, you know, we're all looking at our instrument panels now with our flight directors, so we don't, we're not looking out for traffic, so we have FLARM and uh, TCAS and ADSB and all that. And so really, uh, uh, this is kind of the end of my talk, that's the end. <laughs> <laughs>